These lion and dragon dancers in Cairns, Queensland, are marking Chinese involvement in Australia's history. In this episode, Chinese milestones in Queensland, 200 years in Australia. Hello, welcome. I'm Greg Granger. Ahead, Australia's own long march. Chinese fortune seekers trekking some 2,000 kilometres across the top end. From gold to harvesting crops. Firing up the pig oven. How one Chinese Australian soldier became a war hero. And how the Great Barrier Reef lures an increasing number of Chinese visitors every year. Australia's Long March. Trekking from the Northern Territory to the Queensland coast. It's Saturday afternoon in Kansas Chinese Gardens, with a weekly rehearsal by teams of local Chinese Australians keen to keep their traditions alive. Local school kids, their families and friends, all keen to get into the spirit of traditional Chinese routines. Generations of families with Chinese ancestors have grown up in this region. Families like the Wadays. So I've had three generations of Wadays here. There are, there are, we're lucky. So dad beside you and mum? Yes, dad and mum, my sister Raleene, my cousin Trevor, my husband and children behind me and my nieces and nephews and cousins behind me. I think since we were big enough to participate and allowed to participate, we've been part of the Chinese Lion Team, going to the restaurants at Chinese New Year. As we've got older, we've um, been performing with the dragons and drag all our husbands and in-laws into the, into the performances as well. Watching today's performances is local historical archaeologist Gordon Grimway. So Gordon, you personally have made quite an amazing discovery. Yeah, quite a casual one too. I was talking to Neil Lee Long of Atherton one day and he casually mentioned that his father had walked across from Darwin to North Queensland. Quite a feat. Oh, incredible. And I, what? I don't believe this. I did some more research and followed up. And he wasn't the only one. There were several hundred, possibly thousands, who walked across over a period between 1886 and the early 1900s. When I started looking into it, I found that no one had really explored it. And with the help of a fellowship from the State Library of Queensland and a Northern Territory History Grant, I was able to spend a lot of time looking through the records in Darwin, Adelaide and Brisbane and coming up with this incredible story that never been told before. Darwin, 1872, the Overland Telegraph had just been completed. Gold had been found at Pine Creek and the Chinese pretty quickly got wind of it and started moving in. Within a very few years, there were 6,000 odd Chinese in the area and about 1,100 Europeans. Further south, as floodwaters raged in the nearby Nitmaluk Gorge, the only railway in Australia ever built with Chinese labour was being erected. Some 2,000 Chinese labourers worked on that. Initially, people were flocking down to the Pine Creek Fields by boat for part of the trip to Southport, and then they were going overland on a fairly muddy track, particularly in the wet season. There was a clamouring went on fairly early on to upgrade the transport, so they put a railway line together. That was built pretty well entirely by Chinese labour. Gold was discovered in Pine Creek in 1872, found initially in alluvial form. The Chinese loved alluvial gold mining. And interestingly enough, Pine Creek had Chinese people who moved into hard rock mining, and some of them made quite significant fortunes, were highly regarded by the European peers for, um, for the work that they did. After initial big finds in Pine Creek, gold petered out. The Chinese prospectors were looking for new discoveries. The gold's run out in Pine Creek. They're looking for other opportunities. They hear that the eastern colonies have got great opportunity, so they head either to the eastern colonies or they go back to China. If they go back to China, they go back to poverty. There's a chance of making good in the eastern colonies. They'll go by ship or they'll walk overland. It was an arduous journey, some 2,000 kilometres across hostile territory. They're heading out of Pine Creek. They're walking through fairly dense savannah woodland. There were problems there with the potential for Aboriginal attacks. There was limited food supplies, limited water. They've got creeks and streams and a few low ranges they're dealing with, high grass. And that, of course, that high grass 
made them vulnerable to the attack because you could sneak in fairly close. The long march across the Northern Territory and Queensland was indeed an ambitious journey, even longer and tougher than the more famous Robe Walk 20 years earlier, where some 16,500 Chinese migrants trekked from Robe in South Australia to the Victorian goldfields to avoid a 10 pound landing tax. The Northern Australian walkers also faced a poll tax, this time from the Queensland government. Once they reached the Queensland border, they tried to sneak across, and if they manage that, they're into Queensland and can get away. Those who get arrested pay a £50 fine, or they go to jail for six months. It's been a long, long, hard slog. For the last three to four months, these Chinese prospectors have been walking all the way from Pine Creek in the Northern Territory to here in Queensland, the township of Croydon. Well, Chinese reached Croydon, they were unable to take up mining because legislation was against them, so they looked for other opportunities. They were entrepreneurs, they'd seen opportunities in commercial activity, they took them up, they became bakers, fruit and vegetable sellers, grew market gardens and provided a substantial amount of produce to the people living in the area. Croydon's timber courthouse was the scene of big differences between Chinese and Australian practices. For instance, as Christine Grimwade relives, they'd break a plate rather than swear on the Bible. The Chinese, of course, weren't Christian, um, and, and so swearing on the Bible was irrelevant to them. It, it had no meaning. Um, so they used a couple of different techniques. One was, was um, snuffing out a candle so that my life will be snuffed out if I tell a lie. The other, other interesting one is where they broke a plate and so my heart and my life will be shattered as this plate is shattered if I tell a lie. At the ruins of Croydon's Chinese temple, Gordon Grimwade, meanwhile, has been enlisted by the local Croydon Primary School to educate their students about the importance of Croydon and its Chinese heritage. Over at Croydon Cemetery, many Chinese headstones remain. Chinese student Tony Zhang is translating those. So here in the Croydon Cemetery, a typical headstone, what does it read, Tony? Uh, this is the name of his village and his hometown, Guan Yi, Qingxi, Xia Tang Chun, and uh, the name of the people, Huang Chang Gong, and uh, he died uh, 120 years ago. Late that afternoon, some of the descendants of Croydon's original Chinese settlers mark our visit with a sunset drink and where Chinese descendant Wayne Bing Chu recounts his own family's early days. My great-grandfather come from China, Canton, followed the gold. A lot of Chinese landed at Maytown, that's up near Cooktown. They sort of worked the fields. They just had a market garden, like with a lot of other Chinese, and that's how they survived. From Croydon, those Chinese who had escaped arrest or had served their six months incarceration would have marched still further east. The next leg would have taken them two weeks, covering the 350 kilometres that brings them to the next big settlement. Australia's long march has taken us right through here to the Queensland Tablelands, the township of Atherton. Now, right here, back in 1903, this Chinese temple was completed, the only temple of its kind in Australia, built of timber and iron. The temple was erected in the centre of what was once Atherton's bustling Chinatown. Uh, the construction, it was built in 1903, although some of the artefacts date from 1895. It's a Taoist temple predominantly, but Buddhists and, and Confucian people can also pray in there as well. These days, the temple is brought alive by enthusiastic supporters. Prayers and the burning of incense are still practised, just as they were 115 years ago. Many Chinese settlers in Atherton grew corn, known as maize, to feed the beef cattle bred in this region. The acknowledged maize king of Atherton was Lee Tsai, whose grandson is Dennis Lee Tsai. My grandfather Lee Tsai came to Ath Cairns originally in 1897, where his older brother grew corn or maize. And later on, he moved to the Tableland 
and he eventually became the largest corn farmer in the Athelton Tablelands and uh, was known as the Mayor of Chinatown or the Herald Sharang, I think is the pronunciation of it. One well-lit feature of the Atherton Temple was a large pig oven. Gordon had this recreation built. So you've rebuilt this pig oven from the original one here back in 1903. Let's get it fired up, eh? You've right, stoked good. it with timber. And down go the matches. Legaport ready to go in and what's happened to our fire bricks? They're red hot and ready to go. Let's go. OK, so we've taken the... Take it in. Gently down. Done. And how long, right. How long are we going to leave that in there? We're going to leave that for about four hours. And <laughs> oh, out of the oven. Look at that. That's been roasting all night. And it's nice and hot. And Chris is going to carve it up for us now. <laughs> Let's get into it. All good. Having trekked all the way to Atherton, word began to reach the Long March travellers that the Palmer River Gold was beginning to run out. They started to venture into new enterprises. The Long Marchers from the Northern Territory were originally heading for this place, Cooktown, the town that the explorer Captain James Cook gave his name to. But learning that the gold was running out here and inland at the Palmer River, those forces began to dissipate. But what had been arriving in years earlier had been Chinese prospectors sailing in, sailing in from Hong Kong and China. In all, possibly as many as 18,000 Chinese immigrants travelled to Cooktown and the Palmer River gold fields. At one stage, there were far more Chinese than Europeans, with Chinese worshippers burning joss paper at the Cooktown Cemetery to appease the deities. Remnants of the big Chinatown that once stood here are evident in the mangrove swamps. Good and remarkable. This looks like ceramic beaches, bits of pottery and ceramics absolutely everywhere. This is amazing because it's on the, we're on the edge of town and it's the rubbish dump from the Chinatown. So there's a glass bottle. You've got That's the right. stem, I've got the, base. got the base. There, the push-up base. And everywhere, everywhere. Oh. Now what have we got? What have we got here? Looks like... Well, th this is the rim of a large pot yes. that would have been up here somewhere. And it was a storage vessel bringing supplies in from China. Burial markers and coins are also being unearthed, as Historical Society Secretary Bev Shea shows me. Bev, you've been finding some amazing relics in the gold fields of the Palmer River, this one being a footstone, not a headstone, a footstone. It's a footstone. The, um, the Chinese put their, their little stone at the foot of the grave rather than at the headstone as we know it. A lot back in the 80s were found by people and taken, and um, now we've been given some for the museum. Over at the James Cook Museum, we find more Chinese artefacts. So the James Cook Museum has amassed a great collection of Chinese artefacts. You're holding a yoke. What's the history here? Well, the yoke was found in the um, market garden area. Now, the yoke would have been worn over the shoulders. They were used for carrying their supplies out to the Palmer River or um, you know, around town doing their domestic duties. The abacus, what's our story here? OK, similar kind of age. Now, that was used in the stores um, around the area. One prominent statue here pays tribute to the Chinese migrants. Alan Wilson campaigned hard to have that erected. Alan, 1885, your great-great-grandfather sailed up the Endeavour River here in search of fortune. That's right, and the, um, that's what we believe. But he is a bit late for the gold rush, so he became a shopkeeper in Chinatown, in Cooktown, which is now known as Adelaide Street. Just as we found in Croydon, the people of Cooktown recognise the significance of their Chinese heritage. And tonight they've invited Gordon Grimwade to report on his findings. This is the Palmer River. Now, it's bone dry right now, but when the waters flowed, alluvial gold was to be found right along its banks. And this lured the Chinese miners all the way from Cooktown, some 100 kilometres. But what a journey. They braved three major hazards. Heat, horrid heat, disease, and attacks by Aborigines. 
The Palmer River was an iconic gold prospector's mining region. And while the gold rush centred here led to the establishment of major settlements, there's little remaining today of this once thriving Chinese settlement on the edge of the town itself, bar a few artefacts. 1873, gold was discovered, caused a flurry of activity. The Chinese poured in direct from Hong Kong and Singapore into the port of Cooktown. They walked over land over 100 kilometres. Within a few years, there were about 13,000 Chinese there and about 6,000 Europeans. As far as we know, the Chinese went pretty darn well. A fair number of them probably did get rich. They kept quiet about it. They just went about their daily business. They made their money, but an awful lot of them didn't succeed in gold mining. A lot of them had tragic ends. For the Chinese prospectors, the gold began to peter out and they turned to the land, clearing the land first and then establishing market gardens, planting crops like sugarcane, lychees and bananas. For the Chinese, lychees are considered a good luck charm, a symbol of prosperity, summer and the birth of a son and heir. These lychee plantations were planted in 1930, with one Chinese family still growing, picking and selling these delicacies. So almost a century ago now, your father planted this, the first commercial lychee plantation in Queensland. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The original trees came from China as a, uh, a wedding present for my mum and dad. And that's how they started the plantation. And so the lead up to that was him sailing out as a 19-year-old lad to Cooktown. To look for gold. In the meantime, he didn't know the gold had ran out, so a group of them decided to walk down to Cairns. And then in Cairns, for a few years, he's moved to Sydney, done some, done some farming Mark there, Mark Gardening, Gardening. Down with his brother, yeah. And then up to the Atherton Tablelands. Up to the Tablelands to grow maize. So he's had a colourful history, yeah. experimented with a lot of crops, yeah. and he's had enormous success. Still further south, the city of Cairns, now the capital of tropical northern Queensland, began to blossom with the influx of both Chinese and European settlers. Much of those early days have been preserved by an active historical group in Cairns, Cadkai, led by Mary Lowe. So unfortunately, um, the Litsungong Temple was closed down in the 1960s, but um, the community at that, at that time we were able to salvage all the artefacts that were in the temple. So it's not only the collection of artefacts that we're looking at here today, but we're seeing a rickshaw, for instance, part of your collection? Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And we do use it when we have events and for Chinese New Year. Artefacts like this ceremonial fan are skillfully restored by Jan Ryan. We've just finished re-cataloguing uh, this particular item. It's a ceremonial fan from the Litsum Guggen collection and this would have been one of a pair that stood on a long pole beside the main altar facing in towards the deities. With the advent of World War I, many Chinese Australians enlisted to fight for Australia. One Cairns resident who went on to become Australia's most decorated Chinese-Australian war hero was Caleb Shang. Today, his actions in the AIF are remembered in the Cairns RSL. He had a contempt for fear uh, and uh, apparently his uh, forte was to uh, go out over the top of the uh, trench of a night time out into the thick of things and sneak around, find somebody to, to dispatch. So a great soldier, which is what has made him Cairns' greatest war hero. Well, that's right. And I think that uh, the reality is there was uh, it was his natural bravery that uh, got him through most of the things. I mean, most men wouldn't even attempt it. They'd be quite happy to stay down behind cover. But when you're continually going out without being asked to do it, it takes a pretty special person. After the end of the Second World War and the end of the white Australia policy, tourism with Chinese around Cairns began to blossom with one major attraction, the Great Barrier Reef. That's become a premier tourist attraction for the Chinese, as local Chinese-Australian travel giant David Nee explains. The Chinese market is growing very strong for the last past 20 years. 
I started with one little bus. Now I have got about maybe 10 vehicles now. One consequence of the boom in Chinese visitors to Cairns has been the appointment of a special Chinese liaison officer by the Queensland Police Force. Basically, the liaison officer is like the bridge between the community and the police. Yeah, you know, this culture is different. So sometimes we need someone to be in the middle to talk to the community, communicate with the police. Yeah, that's my job. These days, Chinese Australian entrepreneurs are thriving in the Cairns region. Entrepreneurs like Harry Su, who runs the busy Cafe China in the Cairns Casino. It's now 200 years since the first official Chinese resident settled in Australia. The Long March marked but one of the early historic events involving Chinese migrants, with the positive contribution these days being felt all over Australia.